What's up? Hey, everybody. Welcome back to our next lecture. We're going to talk about reproduction and meiosis. Okay. It's talking about the process of reproducing sexual reproduction and the cellular division we know as meiosis. Please like and subscribe to the channel if you would like to do so. It helps us out. Also, the Patreon, patreon.com slash twisted science for additional content there. So talking about sexual reproduction and meiosis, meiosis is cellular division when it comes to gametes, which are sex cells. So normal division is mitosis, right? That is going to be a standard cellular division. Uh, meiosis is going to be a gamete reproduction. So that's going to be two fused gamete cells. It is going to lead to two rounds of division. So we have two methods of reproduction that we can go with, right? Living organisms can either go with asexual reproduction, which is going to be derived from the host. That means that we're going to have a single cell organism or a single organism reproduce on its own. Then we have sexual reproduction, which is going to be two hosts or two parents combining genetic information to create an offspring. So we have asexual reproduction where we have a host that's going to produce without the assistance of another organism. And we have sexual reproduction, which is going to be two organisms combining genetic information to produce an offspring. So in this first image, we have a single-celled amoeba. This is an amoeba, so it's a single-celled organism. It is going to reproduce asexually. Here we have a splitting or a division of the cell into two identical daughter cells. And in the second image here, we have puppies, all right? We get uh, sexual reproduction in dogs, so we see puppies that are conceived sexually. They look different because they have a unique combination of genetic material from each parent. So here's the definitions of both of these. If we split them off, asexual requires two parents, no. Produces identical offspring, yes, except for some genetic mutations that could occur. Mutations do occur in both. And is it adaptive to the changing environment? Asexually, no. So asexually, it's not able to adapt because we don't have any variation in the genetic code. So what we are producing from is going to be the same each time. That means that we don't have the ability to cause any mutations or any changes in the genetic code because we don't have new genetic coding being introduced. Whereas with sexual reproduction, we do. We have two different genetic codes that are do, uh, going to combine to form one unique genetic code for the offspring. So that allows mutations and that allows for adaptation to occur. For sexual reproduction, it does require two parents. It does not produce identical offspring, again, because we have that combination of two genetic profiles leading to a unique individual. Mutations do occur, of course, and we are able to adapt. So this is the human karyotype. Human karyotype is consistent of 23 chromosomes, all right? First 22 are going to be standard chromosomes that are going to account for things like appearance, metabolism, all those things. The 23rd is going to be the sex chromosome. The 23rd is going to either be indicated by an XX or an XY. XX is a genetic female. XY is a genetic male, all right? So we have autosomes, which are the first 22, one through 22. And then we have the 23rd, which is our inset of sex chromosomes. So here we're looking at this, all right? This is analogous versus analogous, okay? So here we're seeing two additions, all right? This is a, an analogy of using book. Two additions, all right, of the same thing. So this is going to be two additions of the same book. Here, we have two additions of the same series, all right? So this is our first edition here, analogous sister chromatids. Second edition here, analysis, or sorry, analogous sister chromatids, but they're, they are different from each other. So the second edition, even though it is in the same series of books, is going to be different than the first edition is. So we have ch slight changes and differences in each one of these, and that's going to indicate change of genetic code. So the analogous to homologous pair of replicated chromosomes is going to be a little bit different. So here's looking at what a homologous pair actually looks like or what it actually means, right? So this is going to be a diploid cell 
that contains chromosomes that are inherited from both parents. That means that upon replication, we get alterations in the areas that are coded for. All right. So once we replicate, each chromosome is going to consist of two identical sister chromatids. So our chromosomes are going to be in homologous pairs. We get a chromosome inherited from a mother, chromosome inherited from a father. These are going to be replicated. So you're going to have two of the same chromosome attached. Right? These are what are known as sister chromatids. And that is why each one of our chromosomes is actually two codes of the same thing. So each one of our 23 chromosomes has a chromatid that is going to have a direct replicative on the opposite side. So we actually have 46 individual chromosomes and they are paired to, or sorry, uh, chromatids, and they are paired together to form chromosomes, which there's 23 of those. Human gametes are going to be the oocyte or the ovum, which is the egg, and the sperm cell or the spermatid. Right, the egg cell is going to be from the female. The sperm cell is going to be from the genetic male. Right? For human gametes, we can see that there is a marked difference in sizing here. The egg cells are going to be remarkably larger than the sperm cells. So the invasion of the sperm cell into the egg cell is going to be almost like a, uh, a missile going into the ocean, so to speak, kind of an entry. So the sperm cell has to infiltrate the egg cell's perimeter in order to get its genetic material into the actual nucleus that can combine with the gametic DNA. So here's our normal cell cycle, right? During normal growth, we have mitosis, right? That is going to be standard division of cells over time that happens during adult life. During reproduction and during gamete formation, we have what is known as meiosis. Meiosis is going to be exclusive to sexually reproduced cells, right? Adults are going to produce haploid gametes, meaning that they have exactly 23 of the chromosomes there. So the other 23 are going to be met up with from the other gamete from the other sex. So we produce haploid gametes of sperm and egg with 23 chromosomes apiece, right? And those are created by meiosis. Fertilization is going to create a diploid zygote meaning the sperm and the egg combine together to form a 46 chromosome zygote. Then after that happens, we can begin mitotic cell division. And that will enable the zygote to grow and develop into a fetus and a, an adult human. So each one of these gametes is going to divide via the meiosis cycle. Once we have fertilization, then we will have standard growth via mitosis. So how do we define male and female, right? Well, defining it in other species besides humans is what we're really looking at here. Defining it in humans is going to be whether it's um, genetic sex or phenotypic sex um, can be a general rule. But in humans and closely related animals, with a look at the external genitalia that will usually reveal what an individual's uh, sexual profile is, their phenotypic and their genetic sex. However, it does break down in other animal kingdoms, right? And those other animal kingdoms are going to need a general rule that males will produce sperm cells. Sperm are typically smaller and more abundant, more uh, modal and fertile than the egg cells produced by females. So male frogs, for example, they will release millions of sperm that vie to fertilize a female's eggs. Sponges illustrate a different strategy. They are typically both male and female. All right, so each sponge has the ability to shed either eggs or sperm into the water. So they basically have either gamete that they can use. Plants are uh, even more distantly relevant, okay? So plants are even uh, more unique. Their parts are going to still be classified as male, as, as male and female. The male parts of grass flowers are going to release uh, clouds of pollen into the wind, each pollen grain is going to move for delivering sperm of the plant to an immobile female gamete inside of another flower. All right, so looking at our meiosis division, this is going to be a standard meiotic cycle where we have two cellular divisions that go on simultaneously. So during early prophase in the first meiosis, remember this is going to be a gamete, so this is a haploid cell. 
right? Chromosomes are to condense and become visible. During late prophase, we cross over, mitotic spindle forms, the nuclear envelope breaks down, and we start to expose those chromosomes, all right? We have homologous chromosomes in this case. Next is our metaphase, where we have our paired homologous chromosomes lining up at the equatorial center of the cell before they are beginning to be pulled apart. They will be pulled apart during anaphase by the mitotic spindle to opposite poles. Sister chromosids are going to remain joined together. Then finally, at the end of meiosis one, we have telophase and cytokinesis where our nuclear envelopes develop once more, temporarily decondense, spindle disappears and cytokinesis splits the cell in two at the cleavage furrow. Now though, we are not done. After that, we enter into the second meiosis, right? So what this does is it actually takes the individual chromosomes and divides them further to where we only have one chromatid left over. So now we have a standard set of 23 chromosomes in each cell, but we're going to divide those out further, all right? So we take a second prophase, we take a second metaphase, where we split those apart. We take a second anaphase, where we're moving them to opposite poles of the cell. Second telophase, where we're going to recreate the nuclear envelope, and a second cytokinesis, where we are going to split the cell again. So we end up with four cells at the end, and these are going to be four non-identical haploid daughter cells. So instead of having 46 chromatids, we're only going to have 23 chromatids. And each one of them is going to actually be different than the other because we have divided that cell twice. So we end up with four non-identical haploid daughter cells. They're not going to be identical to the cells that started at the beginning. So these are the stages of meiosis. We do the standard mitotic phases all the way, prophase all the way through telophase and cytokinesis, but we do it twice. So it gives rise to four genetically different haploid nuclei that only contain two chromosomes. During this period, we have crossing over that occurs, right? During our crossing over portion, this is where homologous chromosomes change places and the process generates genetic diversity. So we see each one of these parent chromosomes has allele sections. These allele sections are labeled as such with our letters. The sister chromatids are going to be identical on either side, but during division, especially during meiosis, we are going to see recombination of these. So we could cross over two chromatids and we can replace a section of one with the section of the other. So we see now that we have recombinant chromatids by the time we are going into meiosis two. So that means a part of the allele on the parent chromosome has been changed and swapped for an allele section on the other parent chromosome. So we now have differentiation and genetic differences. These are what are known as recombinant chromatids. And these recombinant chromatids are what go into meiosis too. And that is why when we divide into four, we have non-identical haploid gametes, right? So we're gonna have a parental, a parental, a recombinant, and a recombinant. So looking at variability, a couple of terms that we can go through here. A homologous pair, homologous pairings are two chromosomes that have the same gene sequence, but different alleles of those genes. Crossing over is the exchange of genetic material that produces variability amongst our four chromatid daughter cells. This occurs during prophase one of meiosis. The parental chromatid does not participate in crossing over and therefore retains its original allele combination. The recombinant chromatid does have a new allele combination. So this is going to pr uh, proceed after the crossing over event in prophase one. And this is where we have genetic differentiation. Random orientation can occur. And this is going to be where arrangements of homologous chromosomes are possible during metaphase one. So we have many different ways that those can be arranged and many different ways they can be pulled to reach pull. So each round of meiosis is likely to produce daughter cells 
with different allele combinations because you pull a different portion of the allele to either side uh, each time. And there's a percentage chance that it can happen uh, again and again. So here's an, uh, an example of this, right? During metaphase, okay, if we can transfer through the meiosis process, at the point of metaphase, we can have alignment that is different depending on which section we're looking at. So for first, we see that the alignment of one, two, and three is the, all the parents of the blue on one side, all the parents of the pink on the other. This yields two haploid daughter cells that have the parental combination in one and the other parental combination in the other. But this is not going to happen pretty uh, regularly. So what we end up seeing is a flipping. Right. So for instance, here, see that one of the parental chromatids of the blue actually ends up on the opposite side. So instead of having all blue on one side, all pink on the other, we've now flipped uh, one of them across. So we're pulling this pink one with these two blues to that end. And we're going to pull this blue one with these two pinks to that end. And that's going to create a completely new genetic code or a completely new genome for these cells. Our third alternative has the similar type of thing. Here, instead of flipping with three, we're flipping with two. So our second chromosome present here is going to be altered and we're going to have a different code. So this one's going to be genetically unique comparatively to our second alternative, which is genetically unique compared to our parental consistency of the alternative one. All right, and then a fourth one where we have two flipping over see that this is even going to be more genetically unique, right? Homologous chromosome pairs are arranged randomly. So our four genetically identical germ cells illustrate all the possible orientations of our three homologous pair combinations. The total number of genetically unique gametes is going to be eight, all right? So we have four alternative math pathways, which means we have potential to produce 12 different types of cell Four of them are going to be identical to the parents. Eight of them are going to be heterogeneous. So they're going to be different, unique chromosome alignments. So now we talk about genetic differentiation in twins. There are two, uh, two ways to make twins here, right? We have genetically identical, and we also have dizygotic, which are fraternal twins. So monozygotic twins are going to be two um, two embryos that are formed from the same zygote. We're getting um, two eggs, or sorry, not two eggs, but two embryos that form from one fertilized egg. For dizygotic twins or fraternal twins, we end up having two sperms that fertilize an egg at the same time, right? So dizygotic twins are no more like than non-twin siblings because they start as two separate zygotes. So this is fertilization of two separate eggs at the same time, which ends up creating two genetically different siblings. However, they are going to be born at exactly the same time. So they may share a little bit more of a genetic code than they would otherwise, but they are not going to be identical. All right, so here's a look at the differentiation between our mitosis and meiosis. The difference is going to be because of that recombination and uh, switching of the alleles that happens during prophase one, and also because we are going to be repeating the cycle for a second time. So with normal mitosis, we have prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase, and that's going to cause this cell to split into two identical daughter cells. For meiosis, we're going to change it. So instead of having just the chromosomes condense in prophase one, we're going to have crossing over. So the paired chromosomes are going to condense and that is going to cause genetic differentiation. Homologous chromosomes line up in double file in terms of metaphase one here, where they are in single file in mitosis. Anaphase and telophase are going to be similar. All right, so the homologs are going to separate into haploid daughter cells or sister chromatids remain joint. After that happens, we are then going to separate into metaphase, or sorry, uh, metaphase two for meiosis two cycle. So we have two daughter cells that are going to then be replicated again to make four haploid cells. So our chromosomes line up once more in the middle. Sister chromatids are separated into non-identical haploid cells 
yielding four daughter cells that are not identical to the parent cell. So mitosis and meiosis comparison. Mitosis, our cells are going to be undergoing cellular division. And the cells that are doing this are somatic cells and germ cells, right? For meiosis, we're only looking at germ cells, only looking at gametes, right? Somatic cells do not undergo meiosis. In mitosis, homologous chromosomes do not line up. Crossing over doesn't occur. We only have one cellular division, so we can only yield two daughter cells that are identical to the original cell, except if we have a mutation occur. Primary function of the daughter cells is going to simply be growth, repair, and potentially asexual reproduction, if that is what we are doing. For meiosis, this is going to involve only germ cells. The homologous chromosome pairs do line up. We do see crossing over. There are two cellular divisions, so we go through that cycle twice, meaning that we are going to create four daughter cells at the end, and all four of these are not going to be identical to the original cell. This is what happens during sexual reproduction or combining two gamete cells. So looking at non-disjunction, this is going to be um, an error that occurs during meiosis one. Potential non-disjunction here, right? If we get a diploid cell and we have a non-disjunction, that means that after meiosis one, what ends up happening is that the chromato uh, chromosomes get filtered out into one of the cells and not into the other. So we end up dividing into two cells, one that has all of the genetic material and another that has none of it, right? So we end up getting an abnormal cell division here. That means that we're going to have an abnormal amount of, of uh, chromosomal material left over in the gametes from this one. And at the bottom, we'll have no genetic material at all. So we get two daughter cells that have nothing genomically at the end, right? So this is going to be an abnormal non-disjunction in meiosis one. What happens then is that when we have fertilization, some of these cells are going to be uh, abnormal because they'll have too many chromosomes. Some of them will be abnormal because they have too few. So when we fertilize after our non-disjunction in meiosis one, we'll have zygotes that have three chromosomes when there uh, needs to be only two and one where there needs to be two. So we see too much genetic material here. We see too few genetic material here. And this could be uh, where we see something like Down syndrome come in, which is trisomy of the 21st chromosome meaning that we have three chromosomes there, three chromosomal pairs, and this is where that genetic uh, disorder comes from. If we see non-disjunction in meiosis two, this is going to be a similar thing, except for the fact that we only have one cell left over that doesn't have any genetic material. So, and after our first meiosis cycle, we end up splitting off into two cells, all right, that have genetically identical material here, but we only have 23 chromosomes left over. So if we're splitting those into two pairs, if we have non-disjunction, we end up with those two pairs left over in our final daughter cell while we leave one daughter cell that has nothing. So at that point, our chances of coming out as uh, normal are a little bit better because we've already gone through our second uh, meiotic division. So when we combine with a sperm cell, there's a chance that 50% chance that two of those are going to come out normal because we had a normal cellular division during meiosis one. However, we do have a 50% chance that it will come out abnormally, either with too many chromosomes or uh, too few. So the homologous pair of chromosomes is going to fail to separate, right? Sister chromatids fail to separate during meiosis two. So one gamete has an extra chromosome and one is missing. The other two gametes are unaffected. So that leads us to talking about Down syndrome, right? This is trisomy of the 21st chromosome, meaning that we end up with three chromosome pairs, right? A normal human karyotype up here. Again, we have two, but with our trisomy 21, we end up with three pairings of the 21st chromosome. And those three copies end up with the resulting genetic disorder of Down syndrome. Some other chromosome abnormalities that we can see, 
Um, there are sex chromosome abnormalities that are pretty prevalent and somewhat common. One is going to be the triple X, right? This is known as triplo X. This is going to occur in roughly one in every 1500 females. All right. This is where we are genetically female and we end up with an extra X chromosome on our 23rd set. XXY is called Kleinfelters. This is going to be in one in uh, 750 males. The result here is that we see enhanced female characteristics because we have an extra X chromosome there. So we end up with depression of some traditional male characteristics and male development pathways. XYY is known as Jakobs or XYY syndrome. This is one in every 1,000 males or so. Right. This is just going to be um, enhanced secondary sex characteristics of male origin. Um, let's see. And XO is where we lack a second sex chromosome. So instead of having an XY or an XX, we just end up with a one X and then nothing. So this is where we're going to end up being genetically female, but we won't have proper development of the reproductive tract because there isn't a second X chromosome. All right. So. Looking at this, covering genetic division, right? We know that our base unit for DNA is the nucleotide. Each nucleotide is going to be something like uh, cytosine, guanine, adenine, and thymine. Every time that we have a three nucleotide code, it's going to encode for an amino acid, right? Every time that we code for an amino acid, we have a protein that we are making. DNA is condensed down into chromosomes. An unreplicated chromosome is simply one alignment of a set of alleles that contain our genes. A homologous pair is when we have two chromosomes that are inherited from one parent and each is carrying one allele for each gene. Haploid and diploid cells. Haploid cells have one set of chromosomes, diploids have two. So one full set from each parent. So if we get a haploid cell with an unreplicated chromosome, we can combine it with another haploid cell with an unreplicated chromosome to get a diploid cell with one pair of unreplicated homologous chromosomes, one from each parent, right? Diameter of a DNA double helix is about two nanometers in size. Human chromosome length ranges from two to 10 picometers, or sorry, uh, mic micrometers in size. And a typical human cell's diameter is about 50 microm micrometers in size. All right. Thank you all for listening. That was our lecture on sexual reproduction and meiosis, right? So our standard meiotic cycle. Thank you for listening. I appreciate it. I will uh, hope, hope that you like and subscribe to the video. And we will see you next time for our next uh, video on our future topics. Peace out.